All right, so where we're going with this is you need to be able to look at a compound and do whatever your process is to tell whether it's polar, nonpolar, or ionic. So those are the only three categories that will matter for this section and for when we talk about intermolecular forces, also known as IMFs. So um, let's do some polar compounds. They have a net molecular dipole, as we've been talking about. So examples, H2O. We've talked about it, but let's do it again. We can draw its uh, dipoles, and we can also draw its molecular dipole. And the molecular dipole, remember, is the sum of these two. And then the other thing to remember is, if we look at our rule that says, go to the central atom, if you see different things in hydrogen and a pair of electrons are different things, this must be polar as well. Number two, this is a common one, um, acetone as it turns out. And I'm not going to draw multiple um, tetrahedral shapes for this one. So here's one representation of acetone. I'll go ahead and put the two electron pairs around the O, kind of askew there, which is weird, but they're there. Now for this molecule, what you should see is that while it has some carbon and hydrogen parts, so carbon and hydrogen parts are nonpolar, CH parts, nonpolar, and as you get to larger and larger molecules, this is harder and harder to see, but CH parts are nonpolar. However, we have this part. And oxygens will tend to make things polar. There's a dipole right there. And uh, that is going to make this a polar molecule. Because that dipole does not cancel out. Now these parts, they are actually moving around, so it's not clear how they cancel out, but they do, and that's what we need to remember. So that's another example of a polar compound. Um, I think those are two of the main ones that we'll see. I'm trying to think if there's another kind. Nope, I think actually non-polar compounds will be interesting. They have no molecular dipole, so some obvious cases. So something like Cl2, which if we draw its Lewis structure. And if you doubt or if you have any questions about what, whether something's polar or nonpolar, always draw its Lewis structure. Always do its shape. That is foolproof. But in this case, we have two chlorine atoms bonded together. They have the same electronegativity, uh, nonpolar. So that one was not too bad. Second example, CH4. CH4 is all carbons and hydrogens. It is probably the simplest case to see, but still not easy, of how all of the dipoles um, cancel out. This is not the shape. This is the Lewis structure. To do dipoles, you typically have to do shape. But our guiding principle Two of this one works for both of them. One, the central atom has all of the same things around it that tends to make it nonpolar. Two, it's all carbons and hydrogens tends to make it nonpolar as well. This is nonpolar. Here's an interesting one that's nonpolar. So uh, this is going to be uh, ozone. And your first thought is, well, it has all of the same atoms. Now I'm just gonna go ahead and draw the shape here. We did it earlier in the lecture outline notes. And even though this is a central atom with a pair of electrons on it, since all of these bonds are no dipole, they have the same atoms, this is also nonpolar. 
And our goal here is not to trick you, it is to show you all the different things that can be nonpolar. Here's another one. And these and this this one is actually pretty tricky too. If you draw its shape and we have before and uh, actually the combination shape Lewis structure so you can have that too. You get this. And you might be tempted to say that these are different. However, this has resonance structures. And resonance structures say that all of these bonds are actually four-thirds bonds. They're all the same. And when they're all the same, and between the same two atoms, this sulfur does have all the same things around it, nonpolar. And I know those, some of those are tricky. Um, yeah, good. So three categories, we've already done two of them. Our third one is ionic compounds. They have full on positive and full on negative charges. Examples of this, well, straightforward example, sodium chloride. And we've been talking about this almost since day one, if not day one, how to look at a compound and tell whether it's ionic, how to look at a compound and tell whether it's covalent. Covalent, remember, has all non-metals in it. Ionic has uh, a metal cation and is just made out of ions that hopefully we know our nomenclature enough to recognize ions now. Maybe we can't know it all. So this is ionic. It's on the ionic page. Maybe I don't have to write that every time. Uh, here's one. Uh, oh, ammonium oxide, a strange compound, but um, ammonium is the only non-metal that still makes it ionic. And this is tricky, I know, because here we've got um, non-metals. Yes, it's tricky. Uh, here is another one. Also ionic. And here's the trickiest one. So this is ionic because it has the ammonium ion in it, but it still contains only non-metals. Yes, very tricky. But if you know your ions, you will be able to tell it. Uh, I'm trying to think what else. Um, maybe uh, sodium acetate, uh, which you can see in two different ways, depending upon how we write the acetate ion. But you'll notice, except for ammonium, they all have, let's see, uh, calcium sulfate, also ionic, all ionic. And it's, you're going to see it's more important to get all of these as um, to recognize ionic versus polar versus nonpolar.